happy to welcome Mike J, um, our speaker tonight. Um, the inclusion of uh, the talk in the program um, departs from two quite discrete works in the exhibition upstairs. Um, one in the first gallery, uh, in the Cars Room, is a reproduction of a drawing by Joey the Mechanical Boy. Um, Joey was diagnosed as a schizophrenic but could also be seen maybe more so nowadays on the um, autistic spectrum. And he fully believed that he was a machine. So the drawings become um, very detailed diagrams of the very complicated mechanical apparatus which was integral to keeping him alive. Um, and in another gallery, there's another very small reproduction of a drawing by um, Jacob Moore. And he was a farmer, also diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. And the drawing shows what um, Victor Tausk had coined as an influencing machine. Um, and in the drawing, you can see uh, presumably the psychiatrist holding a box emanating all of these rays and invisible forces which were attacking his victim, presumably more. Um, so it was looking into these two case studies um, and also the history of psychiatry and representations of madness, something that we have addressed in previous um, events, um, which led to the case study of James Tilly Matthews and to uh, Mike Jay's book on the influencing machine. Um, so, Mike Jay is an author, historian and curator who has written widely on the histories of science and medicine and particularly on the cultural history of drugs, madness and psychiatry. His books include High Society, Mind-Altering Drugs in History and Culture, which accompanied the exhibition he curated at the Wellcome Collection in London in 2011. Um, his writing has appeared in Raw Vision, London Review of Books, Wall Street Journal and Notes and Records of the Royal Society and he is a trustee of the Bethlehem Art and History Collection. <laughs> um, so following Mike's presentation we'll have a very short uh, discussion but hoping to leave lots of time for questions from the floor. Um, if you could hang on for the roving mics because we are live streaming and we're also recording the talk. Um, so yes, Effie and Alan will be on hand with mics. So um, I'll hand over to Mike and thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Emma, yeah, thank you all very much for coming and uh, foregoing the warm sunshine that's uh, finally arrived. And um, yeah, welcome to the world of uh, James Tilly Matthews. Uh, this is um, the heirloom which Matthews drew in uh, 1810, so it's the first, uh, by some long considerable distance, example of what we would now call, as Emma said, an influencing machine, uh, a mind control machine, a device that controls the mind. Uh, so I guess an influencing machine is something that um, controls people's thoughts and actions at a distance, as you can see here. Um, it's based on kind of cutting edge technology, or actually a bit more than that kind of over the horizon technology, maybe even impossible technology. Uh, and it's always covertly operated by a kind of secret um, gang of persecutors who nobody else can see. Um, and uh, as you'll see, all these features are present and correct from the very beginning in the heirloom. Uh, as well as describing something about this and decoding it and trying to get a sense of um, what Matthews was, uh, is, is trying to tell us, um, I'm also going to suggest that this is uh, the idea of the influencing machine represents a watershed in our technological imagination. That until this point, machines were, you know, in the um, phrase of the exhibition, dumb things. They were things that we manipulated. Um, this is the point at which our relationship with uh, machines and technology becomes more complicated um, when people start to have the idea that um, this um, technology and machines can actually manipulate us. And in fact, um, the heirloom is the first example of a machine that can actually turn people into machines. So, What's going on? Um, the heirloom is pretty much what it says on the tin. It's um, an heirloom. It's predicated on the idea um, that there are different airs and gases that can be woven together and kind of modulated to produce different effects. And um, 
really what it's in terms of the technologies of the time, which is what's so fascinating about it, because it's so much earlier than any other influencing machine. It's kind of completely different technologically. Um, what's really underpinning this is the idea of mesmerism, which was just um, be being discovered at the time. Um, you know, mesmerism was an extreme extraordinary power of sort of action at a distance that enabled somebody, a mesmerist, to influence their subject or patient or victim in all kinds of ways. You know, um, mesmerism produced incredible effects. People would contort and have fits and uh, do extraordinary things when they were mesmerized. So I guess the basic idea of the heirloom is it's a kind of like mesmerism on an industrial scale. It's using um, the new chemistry, the new chemistry of gas is pneumatic chemistry as it was called to kind of power this sort of mesmeric effect and uh, make it um, you know possible to control people over enormous distances and with uh, incredible power so the way the machine works those barrels there um, that's where the um, gases uh, and the airs um, that uh, power it are stored and um, I'll just read you a little part of James Tilly Matthews's list of of uh, what these gases are that uh, power it, because uh, they give you um, a, a good sense of where he's coming from. Uh, he describes them as putrid effluvia, um, and, um, he, and, and, they, and they include, this is part of his list, seminal fluid, male and female, effluvia of copper, ditto of sulphur, ditto of nightshade and hellebore, effluvia of dogs, stinking human breath, Ditto of mortification and the plague, stench of the cesspool, Egyptian snuff, vapor and effluvia of arsenic, poison of toad, and so on. So this is a kind of, you know, <clears throat> very high-tech looking machine, but it's being powered by this uh, um, amazing and horrific and nightmarish thing that kind of reads like it's coming out of some uh, medieval text on witchcraft. The different... Um, gases and airs when they go into the machine are then combined and woven together in different ways. You can see the kind of levers and the stops that are used to do that. And different um, uh, gases woven in different ways produce different effects. And the effects are um, what uh, Matthews calls event workings. And there's a long, long list of them as well, different things that you can do to the victim uh, by manipulating the heirloom in different ways. So. Um, I'll give you some of those as well so you can get a sense of those. Um, fluid locking, for example, this is a thing where you constrict the fibres at the base of the tongue so that if you do it to somebody they can't speak. Um, thigh talking, that's totally self-explanatory, making voices coming out of, out of the victim's thigh. Kiting, um, this is something that Matthews talks about a lot. Um, you can with the heirloom, you can put, put an idea into somebody's head. You can kind of fly it like a kite so that the victim, when they're having this idea projected into them, they may not want to think about it. They may be trying to think about something else, but they can't help returning to this idea. Lengthening the brain. This is another event working. Um, and that means kind of taking the thoughts in your head and making them appear ridiculous. So if Matthews, for example, wanted to explain that the heirloom was uh, assailing him, and wanted to explain what it was doing to him, and he'd figured it all out, and he was going to explain it very rationally, then um, the heirloom operators would do the lengthening the brain event working, and then when he tried to explain it to other people, he would come out sounding ridiculous and uh, like he was mad. Um, there are various other um, sort of things like thought making, which is kind of like what we'd now call um, you know, telepathy or thought transference, and also lots of physical effects. Um, self-explanatory names, things like foot curving and knee nailing and eye screwing and vital tearing and fibre ripping. And these go all the way up to um, lethal effects like lobster cracking, uh, which is a procedure where you, uh, you know, cre create such powerful magnetic pressure around the victim that you just suffocate them and they die. So it's a pretty terrifying machine. Um, in fact, I, I, um, I did encounter it um, once. It, was, uh, it looked like this. It was, um, this is a reconstruction of it from the plan that we were just looking at. Uh, this was built about 10 years ago by the installation artist uh, Rod Dickinson. And there it is in the Lang Gallery in Newcastle. And, um, you know, that's a pretty big gallery. It's an enormous machine, and it really does kind of loom over you in every way. It's, very, it's really quite terrifying. It's quite a, um, it's quite a creepy thing to uh, spend a lot of time around. 
So let's see if I can tell you a bit more about what's going on in the picture. Um, the heirloom is operated by a gang, and these are a gang of undercover Jacobins. They're French revolutionaries, and they're here um, in Britain. They're in London, and they're trying to, um, they're, they're using the machine to control people's minds and influence the uh, Napoleonic Wars, the wars between Britain and France. That figure in the middle operating the machine, he's known as the middleman. Uh, Matthews gives us very, very vivid descriptions of all these different characters. The middleman um, is uh, very technologically skilled. He actually builds heirlooms, and he's um, operating the machine at this point. Um, he's not the boss. The boss is a character called Bill the King, who isn't in this picture. Um, the character down at the bottom is called Sir Archie. He's a sort of lower member of the gang, a flunky. He's always kind of cracking obscene jokes and quite often dresses in drag. Uh, that's um, Charlotte, the woman in the corner there, and she's often chained up. Matthews can't work her out, can't tell whether she's a member of the gang or whether she's being kept as a prisoner. So she's maybe the sort of the Patty Hearst of the, of the story. Uh, this figure up here is called um, Jack the Schoolmaster, and he's the second in command of the gang, and he's the recorder. He's always taking notes, so he's the person uh, who writes, um, you know, makes notes of uh, the heirloom settings that were used and the event workings that were produced and um, keeps a tally of everything. And this figure up in the top in the beam, the victim, we don't know who he is, but I sort of always think that he's probably James Tilly Matthews himself. Uh, there are no portraits of Matthews, so we don't know what he looked like, but you just think, well, who else would he portray up there as the victim of the heirloom caught in its beam? So uh, I'm kind of guessing that's him. Um, the world of the heirloom is, this is all part of a bigger story. There are actually many different heirlooms in London at this point. This one is uh, concealed in a cellar. Um, very close to London Wall in the centre of London, very near to um, Bethlehem Hospital, uh, Bedlam, uh, which is where Matthews actually is uh, living at this point. Uh, he's being confined there as an incurable lunatic. But there are other heirlooms near the Houses of uh, Parliament, for example, and um, all kinds of people are being controlled by heirlooms, particularly politicians. So William Pitt, the Prime Minister, is being controlled by an heirloom. So uh, when he stands up in the House of Commons and says it's very important that we have to keep on you know, fighting this patriotic war against France, that's not actually him talking. Um, that's what they want him to do because they want him to destroy Britain and that's part of their plan. Um, other members of heirloom gangs mingle around in uh, London, you know, in coffee houses and taverns. You never know when you're standing next to one. Um, they carry little vials of magnetic fluid around because to influence people, um, they have to kind of uh, uh, imbue them with magnetic fluids and gases that they breathe in. And once you've done that, then the heirloom can find you. And Matthews, because he's the prime target of all this, Matthews has actually had a magnet implanted in his brain. So it's incredibly easy for them to control him with an heirloom. So, and what, um, what's the context in which this appears? Well, this illustration first appeared in 1810 in a book called Illustrations of Madness that was written by a man called John Haslam, who was the apothecary at Bethlehem Hospital at uh, Bedlam. And it was the, it's very famous in many, uh, for many reasons. It was the first sort of book length case study of the delusions of a mad person. Up until that point, if you kind of um, read the sort of literature on madness, you tend to get very brief uh, descriptions of uh, what's afflicting people or what they're thinking. You know, you get some, you know, maybe they're melancholy or maybe they're raving or there's a whole sort of vocabulary of terms, but you don't go into a lot of detail about what they thought and what they believed. Matthews's delusions were so extraordinary that um, has them filled an entire book with explaining how this world of the heirloom worked. He didn't do this because he thought it was interesting or clever or true. Um, rather the opposite of all those, he believed it was folly to listen to anything that mad people said. Um, but he wanted to show um, that he was a special new kind of medical professional, uh, what would later be called a psychiatrist, someone who was specialised in dealing with mad people. Haslam was an apothecary, not a physician. Physicians were superior. He had a huge chip on his shoulder about not being a physician. Uh, and he um, was furious about the fact that quite a lot of other physicians had been to visit James Tilly Matthews in Bedlam and had pronounced him sane. 
because the funny thing about Matthews is when he wasn't talking about the heirloom, he was extremely intelligent, articulate, charming, gentle, um, by all accounts a really lovely person. His family all loved him. They, none of them understood why he was locked up in Bedlam. They all wanted him you know, to be allowed out. Um, and they brought doctors to see him and he'd have long sort of conversations with doctors and be perfectly sane. So the reason that Haslam wrote all this stuff um, down at enormous length was to demonstrate that Matthews was mad and that if um, physicians could talk to him and not investigate that madness, then there needs to be a new special kind of doctor who dealt with mad people who understood how all this worked. Um, Haslam's idea was, in, in his idea of madness was in many ways very modern. He believed, you know, um, that mad madness had always been seen as a kind of a sickness of the soul or a punishment from God. Haslam wasn't having any of that. He believed it was an organic disease of the brain, you know, and it was like, it was like measles, you know, you could tell whether somebody had it or not. You just had to know what the symptoms were and you had to observe closely. So this is Haslam's example, you know, this is how you observe and report and uh, describe a case. But because of all the detail that Haslam's produced, um, it means that um, Matthews's account of the heirloom can be sort of hijacked and used in all kinds of ways. Uh, and the way in which it's usually been used um, by psychiatrists is to point to it and go, this is the first clear example that we have in history of what we now call paranoid schizophrenia. Um, it's a funny thing, actually, that um, it's quite hard to find examples of schizophrenia in history. Um, which shouldn't be the case if, as we're now told, you know, it's genetic and it's about kind of, um, you know, brain chemistry and imbalances and so on. Um, it shouldn't really be a modern condition, um, but it's very hard to find it. So um, psychiatrists are very pleased when they find something that fits very neatly with the sort of modern categories of schizophrenia. And the heirloom um, fits very well with that because um, psychiatrists now recognize that um, some, not all people um, with diagnoses of schizophrenia, believe their minds are being controlled by influencing machines. Um, because people with that diagnosis quite often um, have the sensation um, that they're not in control of their own lives or of their own minds, of their own bodies, that thoughts are being forced into their heads that they're being compelled to do things. This is what psychiatrists now call passivity phenomena. So the heirloom is the kind of typical sort of form of uh, construct that um, people with schizophrenia come up with to explain what's going on. Um, and the gang, of course, you know, this is sort of classic um, delusional paranoia and so on and so forth. So you can make James Tilly Matthews's case fit the modern diagnosis of schizophrenia um, quite easily, um, as long as you ignore certain bits that don't fit quite as well as the other bits. Um, I'm not contesting that, but also I don't think it tells us very much about Matthews. Um, schizophrenia, of course, didn't exist at the time. It only existed, you know, from about 1911 when, um, you know, Kreplin and Bloiler and those, um, you know, early psychiatrists invented it as a category and it put together all these different sort of symptoms that hadn't been put together before. So in a way, it's not surprising um, that that you couldn't find it um, earlier on in history. And also, it doesn't really make sense of somebody before that point to say, oh, they had schizophrenia because there wasn't any such thing. So I think um, it's, uh, you know, um, it's an anachronistic category and it has limited explanatory power. I think the way to understand more about what's going on with the heirloom is to look more closely at Matthews himself and at his life and times. Matthews was a uh, tea broker. Um, in the 1780s, that's the first thing we know about him. Almost everything we know about him, we know from his medical records and from his own writings. Uh, so um, his story starts in uh, in London. He's from Wales, actually, but he's come to London. Uh, he's a young businessman working in the tea trade with a young family living in South London in uh, Camberwell. Uh, the tea trade is full of um, Quakers, uh, nonconformists. Um, and a lot of sort of political activists and political reformers and Matthews moves in those circles. He's very committed to progressive political causes. So rights of man, democracy, liberty, anti-slavery and so on. Uh, when the French Revolution happens, he welcomes it uh, and he gets to go out in the early days of the French Revolution in 1792 um, with uh, a man, his political mentor, a man 
man called uh, David Williams, who was a constitutional expert and who was invited out um, by the French Revolutionary Assembly to uh, help um, draft the uh, Republican, uh, the, the, the Revolutionary Constitution. While he's out there, um, then he, uh, then uh, the revolution starts to sort of tip into terror. Uh, the king uh, Louis the Sixteenth is executed, um, and it looks more and more like Britain's going to declare war with France. Matthews is a sort of, is a peace campaigner, and he starts working very hard through diplomatic back channels to stop France and England from going to war. And he comes up with this peace plan, which he gets the French um, Assembly to sign off, and then shuttles back to England and has meetings with the with Pitt, the Prime Minister, and shuttles backwards and forwards, um, trying to sell both parties on the idea of the French coming up with a constitution that's very like. Our constitution, you know, a sort of limited monarchy with a sort of parliamentary democracy. And his idea is that then France and Britain can be allies and they can go forward together, you know, um, rather than going to war. But war is what happens. Um, and Matthews's um, diplomatic intrigues become more and more frantic and more and more dangerous until finally he's arrested in France by the Committee of Public Safety, um, the uh, Jacobin police state and um, he's uh, kept under house arrest in Paris for a while and then transferred to a series of revolutionary jails. He has a nightmarish three years um, in the middle of the terror uh, every morning waking up never knowing whether he's going to be guillotined or not. Finally after three years he's released. He comes back to England uh, and he goes and uh, to, back to talk to the politicians who he thinks betrayed him and abandoned him. And of course they ignore him at this point because uh, you know the war with France has become our great patriotic uh, cause and they don't want to hear about this. Uh, they don't want to be reminded about these sort of fumbling peace intrigues of three years before. So Matthews starts writing letters to Lord Liverpool, the Secretary of State. Uh, Liverpool ignores his letters and eventually Matthews stands up in the public gallery of the House of Commons while Liverpool's speaking and accuses him of treason, at which point he gets bundled off and then locked up in Bedlam. So that's how he gets there. Um, it's only once he's been in Bedlam for a while that you start to get to the idea of the heirloom emerging in his conversation and, 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 and his, in his writings. And I think it's... Um, uh, I think, you know, its emergence is tied in with his story. You know, I think the, the key phrase here is double agent. You know, Matthews was a double agent trying to sell peace to two parties who were going to war. So increasingly, as he goes through, you can see from his, from his letters, which are kept in the French um, uh, directory archives, um, when he's talking to uh, French politicians, um, he's selling himself as a, um, protect, as a sort of defender of uh, liberty as a sort of sans culotte, as a republican, as a sort of partisan of the French cause. When he's back in England, he's trying to sort of paint himself as a British loyalist. It becomes more and more kind of impossible for him to, you know, these roles become more contradictory. It becomes more and more impossible for him to make sense of his own actions. And um, you can see where the heirloom emerges because um, uh, when he starts talking about what the heirloom gang were doing, doing things like, for example, passing military secrets, uh, British military secrets over to the French and stuff, well, that's actually stuff that we know that Matthews was doing it. So he obviously got into the situation where he was behaving in two completely different and contradictory ways, and the idea that, well, part of the time he was under control of the heirloom, and that's why he did that, kind of starts to make sense of where he was. I mean, the wider question... Um, and, you know, it's the question of why he thought that it was a machine that was doing this. And that's a question that he can't, you know, we can't ask Matthews and he, uh, why, you know, why that was the case, because he just knew that it was a machine controlling his mind. And he probably didn't know that he was the first person who'd ever thought that. So um, we have to kind of cobble it together from a sense of his life and um, a sense of where, it, which, you know, which is very interesting because he was in many ways a citizen of the future. You know, he was a very progressive, forward-looking person. So he wasn't, um, so the heirloom, I think, is not about all technology being evil. He's not like someone like William Blake, for example, who thinks this is all a kind of, you know, sort of terrible, godless separation from nature. These technologies, um, 
mesmerism and magnetism and um, pneumatic chemistry. These were all sort of technologies that were very much associated with uh, revolutionary politics. Um, pneumatic chemistry, particularly sort of gas chemistry, the one figure in Britain who that was associated with beyond anybody else was Joseph Priestley. And Joseph, Joseph Priestley was also, um, you know, a political radical and a reformer and a nonconformist, you know, closely associated with David Williams and uh, uh, Matthews's coterie. Um, in France, of course, the great figure in gas chemistry was Anton uh, Lavoisier. Lavoisier, also a revolutionary. Um, but all the optimistic dreams of this technology, which was supposed to perfect humanity and to enable us to move out of our benighted state into a more you know, enlightened future democratic world, all this crashed and burnt in the French Revolution and the terror. So Joseph Priestley, for example, had his uh, laboratory ransacked and uh, torn to the ground and he had to go off to exile in America. Lavoisier was... Um, executed by uh, by guillotine you know famously if apocryphally um with the jacobins saying the revolution has no need of scientists so i think this is the world of the heirloom it's a world in which um this technology and these new machines that were supposed to make us perfect um, have fallen into enemy hands and they're being used instead to enslave us this is the other image that goes with that uh, with that drawing this is a, as you can see this is sort of overhead view of the scene that we've been looking at um, is it, is it, you can read at the top Matthew says he's got beautiful copper plate writing it's one of the joys of um, working on him is uh, reading everything he writes it all looks beautiful um, all this appears to him by sympathetic perception when he gets to the point where he's trapped in the beam then um, just at the point when he's falling under the heirloom's control, then he, start, he can see briefly, kind of dimly in his head, he can see this scene, he can see the cellar, he can see the heirloom gang, and that he looks at them and they look at him, and they kind of taunt him and, uh, and, and, and tease him. Um, but he can't see everything. Um, there's this great bit down at the bottom where he says... Uh, door into a back room where I have not the least perception of them beyond the said door. So there's always the sense with the heirloom, just as uh, in the main drawing, you have those kind of upper sails that are drawn in, in a sketchy kind of way, and Matthews doesn't quite understand what they are. There are always bits of this story that he can't quite see, and this turns out, um, you know, later on to be the case with all influencing machines. Uh, but, um, you know, this is sort of the tip of the iceberg, and in fact, you know, there's a bigger conspiracy going on here. It's not just about, um, you know, the Jacobins and the French Revolution the Napoleonic Wars, you know, there's, there's something bigger going on which involves, you know, the British government and the whole state, and in fact, Bedlam itself. And I think that's the other way in which um, we can read the heirloom, is as a kind of um, looking glass version of Bedlam. It doesn't, um, the, the heirloom, as I've said, doesn't really appear in Matthews's writing until he's been in Bedlam for several years, and his letters to Lord Liverpool before he goes in, for example, they're full of mad, grandiose conspiracies, but there's no heirlooms. I think the sort of the world of the heirloom is this kind of upside down version of, uh, of Bedlam. Um, there are sort of very suggestive details that you can read across from one to the other. But the Jack the Schoolmaster figure who's sitting there taking notes is very like John Haslam in many ways. You know, he's the second in command. He's sitting there taking notes. Of course, Haslam spent years in Bedlam sitting, taking notes, you know, listening to Matthews. Um, he's, uh, uh, you know, he, he he insists on his power as a mad doctor. You know, he's kind of like a mesmerist, you know, controlling his patients. Um, beneath him, there are these functionaries scurrying around in the gloom and cracking obscene jokes. And one of the things they say to him when they've caught him in their beam is, uh, ha-ha, you're in Bedlam, and everybody thinks you're supposed to be here for your own good. It's supposed to be making you better, but we know actually the point of this place is to make you mad and to keep you mad so nobody ever listens to what you have to say and nobody ever takes you seriously. And you know there was a, a you know there was an element of truth in that you know um, Matthews was being locked up 
um, under letters from uh, the Home Secretary, which said, we trust you'll keep Matthews there. Matthews did actually have political secrets that people didn't want, that didn't want to get out. Um, you know, he always said he was a political prisoner. And, um, you know, while he was certainly delusional in some ways, he was probably quite right about that. Curiously, Matthews' story has sort of something almost like a happy ending. Um, after he draws the heirloom, he gets very interested in drawing and very, very good at it. And the next year, um, the old Bedlam building, um, is, which is tumbling down, is due to be replaced by a new um, Bedlam building um, in Southwark, the building that's now the Imperial War Museum, actually. And there's a competition to des design a new Bedlam, and Matthews enters it and produces these beautiful technical drawings uh, accompanied by loads and loads of notes which are absolutely fascinating because they're the first time um, that an inmate in a lunatic asylum has ever come up with plans for you know what a lunatic asylum ought to look like uh, and they're full of you know very very interesting perceptions about um, you know what works for the inmates you know what they love and you know what they hate and you know how to make it nice for them and why it's a very good idea for people who run um, asylums to uh, make them you know, comfortable and functional for their inmates or patients because that makes it better for everybody. They're kind of fascinating to read and they also give us another chance to read across between Bedlam and uh, the heirloom because you start to get sort of phrases from the world of the heirloom appearing here. One of the things that Matthews is very concerned about in his designs is the drains and the sewage, sewage system because he's says the trouble with the current bedlam is that it kind of the, um, the drains back up during the night and produce all this putrid effluvia, you know. So, and so maybe all that, all that stuff that was in the barrels, that's actually, you know, the horrible smell in bedlam itself. And he's now trying to figure out how to deal with it. It's kind of escaped from his delusional world and become a practical problem that he can do something about. Uh, and he gets very interested in... Um, in, in, in practical problems and trying to find sort of useful solutions to them. In fact, after he produces these plans for Bedlam, um, he produces the first couple of issues of a part work magazine called Useful Architecture. Um, this is a page of it. Uh, Sir John, John Soane, the architect, was very taken with this and he's got, a, um, he's got a copy. This is a copy from his library. It's the last copy that exists. And Matthews kind of goes through with all these sort of plans for different types of um, buildings and useful tips and hints. So um, this is a kind of modest little country cottage. Uh, this is a slightly grander villa. Um, this all seems very different from the world of the heirloom, but I think it's kind of, um, it's interesting that it's called useful architecture, because I think Matthews has intuited by this point that, you know, he can argue forever about whether he's mad or sane, and that's just an argument that ends up in kind of loads of different affidavits and statements from different doctors contradicting each other. But actually the difference between, you know, people who are useful tend not to be called mad. You know, part of, you know, when people say somebody's mad, part of one of the things they mean is that they're useless. So he's kind of always trying to be useful. Uh, and he always was, of course. He was only trying to be a peacemaker to begin with. That's what got him in there. You know, in Bedlam, he had the reputation for being very gentle and trustworthy and always making peace between different in inmates. Um, and finally, just at the uh, very end of his life, um, he gets let out of Bedlam and moved to a private madhouse in, uh, in Hackney, uh, where he's allowed a lot more freedom. He ends up doing all the accounts for the madhouse and sort of gardening. He's always liked gardening. He has his little patch and his allotment, and, uh, um, and, and that's where his death had all of... Uh, interesting ramifications, but I think um, I shall leave him at this point in his late evening patch of sunlight enjoying his gardening because uh, he more than deserved it. So finally, I'd just like to join the dots between um, the heirloom and what later became known as the influencing machine. Um, this is uh, one of the ones that's in the exhibition. This is uh, Jacob Moore's influencing machine drawn exactly 100 years after the heirloom. And it was at this point that uh, Victor Tausk, who was an early Freudian psychoanalyst, um, came up with the concept of the influencing machine. Um, Tausk's idea was that the influencing machine is actually 
a very rational construct in some ways. Um, that people um, who have this condition, which is just at this point starting to be called schizophrenia by some people and you know different names by other people, um, when they say that they're feeling these extraordinary sensations and pains or hearing voices or seeing visions, they're not making this up. You know, this is really happening to them. Um, and a part of their brain, which is rational but not conscious, is looking for an explanation for what's going on. How can it be that they're hearing voices, for example? Um, and at the time that Tausk is writing, he says, um, an amazing number of people with these conditions are convinced that there's a phonograph hidden under the bed, or there's a telephone or a telegraph. All these new technologies become co-opted. They seem like plausible, reasonable explanations uh, for what's going on. And um, you can see in um, James Tilly Matthews' uh, idea, when he talks about being able to dimly see in his mind's eye the gang, um, he describes this as a kind of, you know, a puppet shows or sort of projections. Um, the language of cinema isn't there yet, but if it was, he'd use it. And as Tausk says, you know, now that cinema's come along, um, loads of people with these conditions start saying they're being persecuted by this machine, which, you know, beams images and films, and it's kind of like a private cinema that's sort of set up in his head and so on. So um, you start to get the idea um, from Tausk that um, this is a kind of bricolage, that people who are having sensations and thoughts that they can't explain are reaching out into the culture and finding things that make sense. And as technology advances and develops, um, the kind of technology that seems to um, account for what's going on moves from being, you know, mesmerism and uh, gas chemistry to being, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, electricity and then uh, electric currents and X-rays and all the other devices that are come along, coming along in Tausk's time, and that you start to see represented in influencing machine art like this. But I think what's fascinating is that um, yes, it's clearly true that um, influencing machines mirror the culture and the technology that's around them and going to use them in um, imaginative and innovative ways. But they also seem to kind of somehow step ahead. Jacob Moore, for example, um, used to um, wear, uh, used to make a vest out of tin foil and wear it under his shirt to deflect all these electric currents. Now that, of course, is now has now become the classic kind of stereotype, cliche, sort of parody of madness, you know, the tinfoil hat to deflect the rays, you know, but that's a hundred years ago that Moore was really doing that. Um, Matthews, uh, with his um, magnetic implant, you know, the idea that he had a he had magnet implants in his brain. I mean, if you just Google that now, you know, there are thousands of people who believe their minds are being controlled by magnetic implants. Um, so there's a sense in which these um, technological ideas aren't simply being mirrored and reflected, they're actually being innovated and generated. And, uh, you know, these machines seem to have a kind of prescient, almost um, prophetic quality in some ways. I mean, of course, the world that Matthews is talking about with the heirloom is in many ways the world that we now live in. You know, how many different invisible rays and beams and signals are going through this room right now? You know, we've got no idea. We probably couldn't count them. You know, at the time when Matthews lived, that wasn't happening, but that's what he thought was happening to him, you know. And, um, you know, so I think they've, you know, they're a very sort of powerful example of the cultural imagination in that sense. Here's a final... Um, influencing machine from exactly the same date as uh, the Jacob Moore one. Um, this is also from the Prince Horn collection, and this is by um, Friedrich Fendt, um, who was, before he was uh, um, locked up in a German asylum, was a sign painter. And his style, his um, way of uh, working, was uh, to um, look out for images in, um, you know, poster ads and um, classified ads. And he'd see things that he thought were clues to what was going on and the people who were manipulating him. In his view, he was being manipulated by sort of hypno-electric powers that were being controlled by his doctors in the asylum. So he found this image. This is actually a um, jacket of a um, paperback self-help book about um, self-hypnosis. And um, he co-opted that, and he's kind of painted himself into it, in sort of in the rays, in the beam. And I just um, thought I'd finish on that because that is um, 
so exactly mirrors um, Matthews's own image of himself a hundred years before. I think, you know, in this sense, you can see, you know, James Tilly Matthews as sort of the patient zero of mind control and of the influencing machine. Something was happening to him that had never happened to anyone before. Until that point, you know, machines had always done um, humans bidding. Uh, now, this was the point when machines started talking back. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. It's really a fascinating case study. Um, and one of the things I think that is really interesting about um, Matthews is the time in which it happened. Mm -hmm. And maybe as, as I understand it, what was happening in Bethlehem or Bedlam at the time was they were responding a lot to his case, to, the, to what he was presenting, and that was building how the practice was formed. Is that, is that right? The relationship between him and Haslam was very was very different in terms of the patient-doctor yeah. relationship. And Matthews was in Bedlam, you know, just at a very, very important sort of turning point in the sort of history of um, kind of uh, um, psychiatry, I guess. Well, it's just the very, very beginning of what we'd now call psychiatry. Um, so the, the um, Bedlam building that he was in was the old sort of Georgian madhouse. You know, this is the one that we know, the sort of Hogarth images of, uh, you know, kind of chaotic sort of visiting day and everybody going to laugh at the mad people. It probably wasn't quite like that. Um, but nevertheless, that was the idea that all you could do with mad people was just lock them up so they didn't harm themselves and other people. Uh, and he's, Matthews is right at the cusp of the point, um, what's going to turn into the sort of 19th century um, asylum. Uh, so both in Britain and in France, you're starting to get kind of uh, enlightened ideas about, um, you know, therapy and that madness isn't just, not just that mad people are just mad and, you know, nothing can be done about it. You know, you can treat them and you can cure them. And Matthews feeds into that and the, um, and the ideas that he produces, um, uh, you know, for the new bedlam and how it should work, uh, um, get co-opted into, in, into it. And they also, you know, parallel things which I don't think he can have known about, you know, the sort of famous things like the, uh, uh, the York retreat, the Quaker um, retreat up in York, which was a very sort of humane asylum for Quaker patients. And um, Philippe Pinel in Paris, you know, who was the first person who started kind of uh, sort of working with um, talking cures and trying to engage patients in their cures. And he's sort of famously, you know, uh, the famous pictures of him striking the chains off mad people going, you know, these aren't beasts, you know, we must lock them up, you know, we must treat them kindly, they respond to it. So he's right at that point, that's the point at which um, Michel Foucault is very engaged in that, you know, what exactly is happening to psychiatry at that point, you know. Um, so Matthews is absolutely right in the center of it, and I think there are no other examples, really, of patients um, who are writing about that, you know, everything else, you know, that you can sort of read and study about what's happening at that point is about, um, you know, doctors and reformers and, um, you know, sort of uh, parliamentarians and religious figures, you know, so you get a unique um, patient's perspective from Matthews. And uh, also around um, representations of madness as well then and how um, schizophrenia was presented maybe to, to a public through visual art, because there is there is a very interesting relationship between um, yeah, depictions of madness or how um, patients express themselves mm, yeah. and how they sort of feed into each other, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the old um, Bedlam had these very famous uh, sculptures um, over the gate of sort of, you know, two figures, one was sort of raving madness and one was melancholy madness, you know, there's this, uh, you know, there's these huge massive stone figures, one of them kind of in chains like that and the other one sort of, you know, melancholy and repose and um, those were kind of seen as the two different types of madness, you know, because they were just the ways that, you know, mad people might present, you know, they might be kind of 
you know, strenuous and overactive and potentially violent, or they might be, you know, sort of shrunk into themselves. And there wasn't much interest in that sort of interior world. What you've got with Matthews is sort of, uh, it's kind of the beginning of the romantic movement. People are getting more interested in subjectivity, more interested in what's going on inside people's heads. Um, they're starting to get the idea that, uh, you know, madness can't be cleanly separated from um, art and genius, you know, and that the, you know, the, the artist is in some sense a, a mad figure. Um, so you get a great revival of, you know, sort of ideas of Hamlet, for example, and kind of, you know, if you look at portrayals of sort of, a fig, you know, sort of um, figures like Ophelia, uh, you know, you, you can start to see that, you know, these figures become kind of more or less sympathetic, you know, is, is Ophelia a kind of um, sort of uh, mad sort of, you know, disturbed child, you know, um, or is she somebody who's just more sensitive to the world than everybody else, you know, you start to, so yeah, uh, it's just at this point, beyond this point, that, that images of madness start in the culture start to get more complex and, um, you know, sort of look further into, you know, become more introspective, more interested in the state of mind rather than just the outward appearance. Because it's also, a, you mentioned them, Foucault, and I'm just thinking in terms of like more recent histories and how um, the the symbol, uh, during the conversations that we were having um, at the anti-psychiatry events, one of the um, speakers had brought up the idea of um, the symbol of schizophrenia as being like the underdog in soci society and how that's um, adopted by, you know, like countercultural movements as being um, a form of those, uh, revolution or... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I don't know if that's yeah, that's right. I mean, that's when the you know a lot of kind of, um, I mean, the great um, anti-psychiatry painting was uh, um, the uh, Richard Dad, the Fairy Fellows Master Stroke, you know, which is that kind of um, very complex fairy painting with loads and loads of different kind of folk and images, very very sort of crowded canvas, um, and it kind of it sort of looks like the um, uh, you know, what you imagine goes on in a mad person's head. Um, Dad was an extremely, um, extremely capable artist. You know, he'd been sort of the academy, had been a sort of professional painter before. Uh, he went to, um, on a tour around the Middle East and um, got a bit of sunstroke or whatever and decided that he was uh, being controlled by um, the Egyptian god Osiris and then came back murdered his father and got locked up. So he was the sort of the perfect kind of mad genius Oedipal figure, um, you know, the sort of poster boy for anti-psychiatry. Um, but, um, you know, was dad actually really an outsider? You know, I mean, he was, um, you know, he was somebody who kind of, if they hadn't been a famous artist, um, you know, would have been hung, would have been executed, mm -hmm. you know, in a way you could say, he got off lightly. And if you look at why he sort of painted those kind of very crowded canvases, um, in a way, I think a lot of that was about his reception. He was selling his work um, to, um, you know, prison uh, asylum governors, you know, who were sort of collecting it. Um, so he wasn't um, working for, you know, in, in the sort of commercial world that he'd been in before. And I think if you look at his work and, you know, the difference between his early kind of commercial work for the Academy and the later work that he does in Bedlam and then in Broadmoor, you know, he's the one of the first intake into Broadmoor. Um, he's just painting the bits he's interested in. He's just got a bit bored with, I think, doing backgrounds and proper compositions, you know, and he just liked kind of cramming all these things together. So um, I think... Uh, yeah, with sort of um, with the anti-psychiatry movement, um, you started to get the patient's voice. You know, had been so excluded up until that point. You know, and you know that was an incredible release. But also at the same time, um, what was projected back into history. Um, you know, you know suddenly things started being seen and interpreted in ways that they wouldn't have been at the time. Yeah, I, I suppose I'm trying to take it back to um, the relationship with the exhibition here, maybe even as well. The uh, what's really amazing, I suppose, is the time in which it was. Um, Matthew's case was that it's very. Um, he was responding to very sort of like grand ideas of you know trying to prevent a war between uh, Britain and France and this idea of terror that was like impending doom. And it was just after the Industrial Revolution as well. There were huge changes um, at the time. And I suppose just thinking about what could constitute an influencing machine now is a very different sort of idea. It seems like, as you say, like, we're, what are we surrounded? 
by in, even in this room, it's a lot more subversive infiltration, maybe, or a lot more discreet and quiet. I don't know what you think about uh, present yeah. day influencing machine. I think, I mean, the influencing machine has just become, you know, uh, sort of culturally omnipresent, really. You know, you don't really have to, I mean, you, you know, you'd have, I mean, it was even when, if you think of, I mean, one of the characters who I think sort of projected these ideas into the mainstream, um, you know, uh, very influentially was Philip K. Dick, you know, who's writing in the sort of 50s and 60s. And at that point, you know, the idea of influencing machines was very much something that just came out of the world of psychiatry, you know, and psychiatric um, case studies and so on. And it was a very difficult thing to try and explain. Philip K. Dick was thought to be kind of really strange and wacky and weird, and like his books kind of didn't make sense. They're all about like the world isn't really real. It's all just like a projection of these sort of aliens that are trying to sell things to us or sort of mind reading or this person's living in this world that's been constructed sort of specifically for, you know, like the Truman Show or whatever, you know. So, you know, uh, you know, those were very difficult and strange ideas. And now they're absolutely everywhere. Every 12 year old who's grown up, you know, kind of watching the X-Files or sort of seeing the Matrix, you know, it's kind of, you know, we just get that immediately, the idea that, oh yeah, this is an influencing machine. You know, this, what looks real isn't real. This is actually just some kind of amazing bit of high technology that's controlling our minds and making us sort of see a reality that isn't there. So I think it's just, um, that's the reason these stories are so resonant now is because, you know, as I said, we now live in the kind of world that Matthews was talking about, you know, a world that he was only imagining that seems incredibly strange to his contemporaries that's kind of, you know, yeah. welcome to our world Because that's the remarkable thing about his story as well, then, is that he was very much ahead of his time. He couldn't have imagined that it would be what we'd be living in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder if we should open out to um, questions from the floor. And there are mics, yes, I don't know if anybody has any. Um, I have a question, which is more of uh, an autobiographical one. But how does um, a tea broker in the 1780s come to find himself suddenly brokering peace between two nations? How did he make that jump or transition? It's very strange. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, you know, he suddenly got thrown into, you know, what you know turned out to be this great epoch-making event. Um, he was. Um, he was a pupil of this character, David Williams, who was um, a non-conformist preacher who also sort of taught, um, he had great sort of educational theories. He didn't believe in learning by rote. He thought sort of people should be allowed to kind of think for themselves and ask questions. So he ran these kind of learning academies, which um, people, particularly in that world, that sort of non-conformist Quaker kind of progressive world, you know, a world that they were very sort of shut out from the rest of English society, you know, they couldn't have you know, government jobs in the civil service or join the army or anything, you know, they kind of made their own world. So there's this kind of little bubble um, that Matthews was in of, um, uh, um, you know, very interesting sort of uh, political reformers. And one of the people in that world who came over to uh, um, Britain in the 1780s and studied under David Williams was um, uh, Jacques-Pierre Brissot. And Brissot at that time was a um, French journalist. Um, he'd kind of uh, done his uh, couple of stints in the Bastille. He had very good revolutionary credentials. Uh, he was a big anti-slavery campaigner and he ran um, a magazine called uh, uh, Société des uh, Amis des Noirs, you know, that sort of, uh, kind of, um, uh, sort of um, slavery abolition sort of journal and society. And um, after the fall of the Bastille in 1789, he went back to France uh, and, you know, found himself right in the middle of the, you know, that first revolutionary scene. So he was one of the people who participated in the tennis court oath, you know, at Versailles where, uh, um, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the third estate all kind of got together and promised to live and then he was in the first French assembly and so on. And then when he was figuring out how to, uh, you know, you know, how, how to sort of set up a, you know, a, a new constitution. Then he thought of his old mentor, David Williams, and invited him over. 
and Williams was one of um, a very small handful, about a dozen people who were made honorary citizens in France at that time, along with Tom Paine and Joseph Priestley. Uh, so um, David Williams got invited, you know, to uh, uh, to draft a constitution, and uh, Matthews tagged along in circumstances you don't quite know about. David Williams wrote memoirs about it afterwards, but at that point it had all gone horribly wrong, and Matthews was in Bedlam, um, and he does this uh, thing. Um, of, and then this person I hardly knew called James Tilly Matthews sort of tagged along behind me, but in fact they were much, much more closely involved than that. So, yeah, that's kind of, um, that's a fascinating part of the story. Uh, how did the concept of the mad doctor develop through the 19th century to what we now see as psy a psychiatry? Yeah, it's interesting. It kind of went back and forth. It was by no means obvious that, um, you know, madness was something that doctors should be dealing with, you know, because it was thought of as more of, uh, more of a, a soul sickness, you know, something that uh, you needed, um, you know, religious treatment for. So um, Haslam was part of a real sort of um, early vanguard in trying to say, no, this is actually a physical disease and you actually need doctors to deal with this. So he was, this was right after, I mean, the madness of King George was a sort of big formative moment, you know, when uh, all these different uh, mad doctors came to minister to uh, George. He probably had porphyria anyway, probably wasn't a mental illness at all, you know. Uh, but um, through the early 19th century, um, so, uh, Haslam was um, fighting a losing battle. Um, you know, there were all the sort of um, those early reforms in psychiatry, a lot of them in Britain um, at least, were driven by religious groups like um, Quakers. And their idea was we should have doctors as far away from this as possible. We should be treating these people as human beings. You know, it was all about kind of needlework and crochet work and gardening and uh, you know having as little of the sort of smell of the surgery around as possible and um, it was always a struggle for um, psychiatrists to uh, um, convince the rest of the medical profession that they were proper doctors you know and I think that's sort of something that still hangs around psychiatry today I mean when we think about modern you know medicine you know what makes modern medicine different from you know the middle ages you know i think it's very much the idea of the cure you know um in olden times you know doctors couldn't cure things they didn't have penicillin you know they didn't have sort of um, antibiotics and surgery you know, all the stuff that we have now they didn't have so dealing with the disease was very much about sitting down with the patient and figuring out how to cope how to survive it you know looking at diet and exercise and how to kind of be with it and live with it uh, and that's kind of, um, you know, the rest of medicine, I think, has moved to this kind of idea of, you know, sort of drugs and sort of pharmaceutical cures. And um, psychiatry has that kind of rhetoric. You know, people talk about, oh, you know, this is a sort of antipsychotic medication, this does that. But we know, you know, when you look at the, um, uh, you, know, you know, when you, when, when, when you look at the statistics that actually um, these drugs aren't that effective. Um, so psychiatry in that sense, I think, uh, you know, is still kind of in, you know, what doctors call the Middle Ages. We're still in that world where people are having to figure out how to deal with this, you know, how to live with it. It's a lifelong condition which doesn't have a cure. So I think psychiatry has always had this um, status, and a lot of psychiatrists are very brittle and very reluctant to accept this. You know, they're always very kind of keen to stress that this is, you know, a, you know, sort of uh, this is a proper branch of medicine. They've got proper cures and proper treatments. But underneath that, I think there's always been, you know, a kind of uh, a more sort of um, folk psychiatry, which is more about older ideas of coping. I'm not sure if this is a question or an observation. Um, so sort of thinking about the influencing machine, I guess before machinery was around, you'd get the idea of being possessed by spirits or possessed by demons, yeah. um, which is kind of a non-human agent. And it struck me when you were describing the heirloom that it's actually run by people. There are people doing it. So there you've got human agent in where before you didn't have human agents. Or maybe you did, maybe you had witchcraft and people were sort of casting spells on you to control you. Um, and now you kind of get more the idea of artificial intelligence, so the machine could be acting on its own. So 
I guess my question is maybe are we going back to the sort of animism? Because I was talking in one of the galleries today with one of the um, gallery attendants about sort of Mark Leckie's idea of going back to mm -hmm. the animism that we used to have in prehistoric times where, you know, stones have spirits and trees have names and all that sort of thing. So I don't know, I guess just asking your thoughts on that really. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I was thinking going around the exhibition. You know, are we moving back towards that or are we moving further away from it? Um, you're absolutely right. Um, the case, you know, the best case studies before James Tilly Matthews that kind of psychiatrists go back to and say that's schizophrenia are usually about divine or um, demonic possession. You know, uh, people who have, uh, and you can see how that works, the sort of dynamics of the heirloom. You know, you've got um, sort of Satan and all his minions kind of, you know, tempting and controlling you. And, you know, um, so a lot of them are cast in terms of um, religious spiritual struggles. And that's maybe another reason why it's hard to find schizophrenia in history, because it looks like, you know, a sort of uh, that kind of spiritual struggle. Um, so Matthews is this, I think, a watershed figure because, um, I mean, it's the story of the Enlightenment, isn't it, really? You know, um, God's been replaced by the machine. Um, you know, Matthews is the first person that we know about, for whatever reason, who, when this starts happening to him, doesn't think, this is the devil, you know, I'm in the middle of some huge cosmic um, drama. Um, his first thought is, there's a machine, I know how they do this, this is mesmerism, and it's powered by gas chemistry, and it'll be Jacobin, you know, he's... Um, I mean, it, it, it doesn't figure that out logically. I mean, it's it's figured out logically, maybe by a part of his mind, which he's not conscious of, you know, but uh, that seems to be, um, you know, it strikes him that that's what's going on. And I think that's, you know, that's a moment when we sort of, when we move away, you know, from ideas of um, witchcraft and uh, demonic possession, you know, which ideas which are still prevalent in, in, in madness at that time. I was thinking about that as well, um, and the parallels with, um, with, with, with animism. And, you know, there are so many different ways in that exhibition of kind of putting together, you know, organic and uh, mechanical and um, sort of um, animist forms, you know. But I think um, one of the things that's central to animism is this idea of, of reciprocity, you know, that these other things we're interacting with also have perspectives and also have subjectivity. Um, and I think, um, you know, machines and technology um, have colonized our imagination to an extraordinary extent. You know, their influence on us has been amazing. And I think the influencing machine is a great metaphor for that. You know, when these days when people have dreams or kind of, you know, have weird drug experiences or something happens to them, they always say, you know, it's like some video game or it's like a, so this kind of CGI. You know, what's happened to these kind of depth, you know, these other, you know, all these forms of consciousness that we used to have that we, you know, we just reach straight for a technological way of describing them, a metaphor, you know, that colonized, you know, the way we think and the way we experience the world. Um, but do they have a perspective, you know, of their own? You know, are they what animists would recognize as persons, non-human persons? You know, I think there's still a sort of, there's a, there's a kind of fundamental difference there. Um, so I think in some ways we're, you know, reapproaching. Um, animist ideas, and in other ways, we're moving further away from them than we've ever been. Um, just picking up on the point you just made there, isn't, don't people reach for the references from cinema and from games and so on, because it's, it's a common frame of reference? Yeah. So if you want to try and explain to somebody else what you saw, what you thought you heard, and you think that that person can relate to the Matrix or whatever it happens to be, that's what you'll use. It's not that yeah, they're no, replacing, it's, it's just that it's a, it's a frame of reference we can both share. It's a cultural shorthand, yeah. no, that's, that's absolutely right. And I guess, um, you know, if you, uh, if you go back, people, you know, people would, find, would have found that in, in poetry, you know, and in, and in other forms as well. Um, but I think it, um, uh, but again, you know, it's those kind of cultural references are approximations, you know, they're in, in a way they're something that... Uh, enables you to communicate that, but they're also something that stops you from quite getting, you know, to the essence of it. Just to carry on from the point about the 
Um, like the, the title of the book being the influencing machine and the kind of focus on the machine and mm -hmm. what the machine is doing in terms of the description of how it's kind of working, but that, that there is this kind of gang of people kind of operating the machine and I would presume also having built the machine. So is there much within the kind of description as to why it's been built and why these people are operating in terms of, um, yeah, like trying to think about that aspect of it rather than the machine itself? Yeah, I mean, that's not a very fully constructed part of the narrative. You get a sort of sense of it being invented kind of, you know, in Paris in the, you know, but it's kind of, it's something that appears, and I guess that's the case with most, you know, if you talk to most people today who um, believe that, uh, you know, their minds are being controlled by satellites or MI5 or um, Freemasons or UFOs or whatever, um, you know, the actual kind of mechanical details of that are often like a little bit vague, you know, and how the conspiracy actually works. Um, so no, there's not a whole lot of that. Um, but I think, you know, the, but the people themselves, you know, the characters are very sort of, um, you know, uh, a, a very, a very vivid. And I think that's, um, you know, that's something that, uh, I mean, within the diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, you know, it's no different, you know, it's the same condition whether you believe that you're in the middle of some cosmic struggle between God and the devil, or whether you believe that you're being controlled by a machine operated by people. You know, that's just, um, you know, a difference in form, you know, that's still kind of the same disease, the same condition. But I think, you know, um, I think those are two very different things to live with, you know. Um, and I think um, it's the, and, and yeah, and I, that's, I mean, it's an interesting point. Yeah, I think in lots of, in, you know, in very, you know, there are some very good accounts of this, and in almost all of them, you get a really strong sense of um, the characters who are operating the machine, and you don't get a really strong sense of the guts of the machine and how it really works. The machine is more something that's, you know, been sort of spread across the background of the story to pull it all together. There was another question here. Um, I don't know if you know the work of Teresa Brennan. Um, one of her books is The Transmission of Affect. And uh, she's a bit of a biological determinist, really. Um, what she talks about is the unseen influences. This may be a contemporary uh, influencing machine, the way that um, pheromones and electromagnetic fields and even the structures of language, even as I'm talking now, probably to a certain extent, the very material ramifications of what I'm saying are having effects in your cranium and determining the thought structures that are going on at the moment. Um, and there seems uh, still to be quite a lot of resistance uh, generally ag against ideas of determinism and, and being determined. And I'm wondering how much this is a, a political structure and a political reaction in societies which are very much invested in the independence and the free will of the individual. It's quite challenging um, for persons invested in that free will and independent subjectivity to uh, then consider, well, actually, in fact, maybe we are all influenced and, and everything we say is already just a mechanistic concatenation. So in, in such societies where individuality and free will is invested in, then people who say that uh, what we're doing or what they're doing may all be determined are inevitably uh, pointed at as being the mad because it, it's, quite, it's quite challenging uh, to the independent subjects. This is just an observation. Yeah. No, no, it's, uh... Uh, no, that's a very interesting one. I'm still fully wrapping my head around the end of it, uh, which is that, um, yes, the, the, the idea that um, characters who construe um, their actions and their thoughts and behavior as being determined um, are seen as mad. But I mean, is that true, for example, of, um, you know, sort of more um, determinist um, sort of um, life scientists, you know, I mean, we have figures, for example, who, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's a lot of experimental work around decision making and the ideas that we take decisions before we realize that we've taken them. Is that, um, do, you, do you think people, you know, do you think that view is kind of held to be mad? 
Well, I, I, I mean, one of the or, most or predictable... Or kind of ultra-rational, you know, maybe, the one, opposite. Yeah, and that, that's interesting as well, of course, that um, this is at a time of enlightenment and enlightenment rationalism, where the independent subject was heavily big invested uh, in uh, also. And uh, maybe in a Western society as well, it's more extreme to go towards uh, mechanistic or distributed or systems understandings of what's happening uh, within what is ascribed as being an individual with free will. Um, but uh, one, one of the most uh, uh, predictable things I find is that you know, I'm, I'm quite a determinist and when I'm in conversation saying determinist things, the most predictable thing is the reaction with which people immediately go, no, 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 there is free will, look at me move this glass. And they move a glass from one place to another. And that's, uh, uh, that's just another side I think I've yeah. done, really. Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of, um, I, said, I mean, there's cross-cultural work on schizophrenia, for example, is interesting. Um, there are lots of cultures where what would be diagnosed as schizophrenia here is seen as spirit possession. Uh, and it's very, you know, isn't as you might guess, um, people who believe they're being possessed by spirits have a much better recovery rate than people who are being told um, you know, you've got a chemical um, imbalance in your brain and you're always going to be mentally ill. Um, it's also because I think the, um, uh, you know, our Western medical paradigm, you know, really traps that in the skull of the individual. It makes it about you, you know, uh, and the sort of dysfunction that you have, whereas kind of otherwise seeing it, see it as part of a sort of more dynamic social relations. It's kind of everybody's problem and everybody can deal with it. That's sort of a, an interesting point, maybe to pick up on in terms of how society breeds what the um, conditions are. And that's something um, I think that's mentioned in your book about schizophrenia. And there's um, terms for when the first case of Matthew you say there's you know one term to describe it, whereas now we have any number of terms to describe mental illness that's born out of a completely different society, a society of like um, claustrophobia and pressure, and um, it's a different. A different sort of time that we're yeah I mean we've got of course a sort of organicist view of schizophrenia which is that it's you know it's biologically I wouldn't say determined but um, it's it's caused and it's sort of you know and it's roughly sort of runs kind of um, about sort of one percent of the population across all kinds of different cultures but also we know that um, second generation second generation immigrants for example and so cultures have much higher rates than other people, you know, so there's a sort of tension, I think, in the idea of schizophrenia, um, which I think is, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very loose concept. Um, it's different in, you know, if you compare, you know, what gets called schizophrenia in um, America and Russia and Britain and France, so they're all quite different. Um, it's not like measles, you know, which is what it is. Um, it's something that we've... Um, you know, was originally identified as a kind of cluster of behaviours, which, because it presented in patient after patient, was put together. Um, but yeah, no, I think there's always been something um, slippery about it and something kind of socially constructed about it. Um, that was one of the things that came out of um, the anti-psychiatry movement was sort of, you know, a, a more um, sort of uh, open approach to um, labelling and diagnosis and. Um, it was interesting, this is something that came from patients, rather than, you know, saying, I have schizophrenia, it's kind of, a lot of people are much more comfortable with saying, I have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, which actually probably fits their, you know, their experience of life a lot better. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting how many doctors have learned that from patients and how the language has changed, you know, and that's been a very sort of, a, a sort of bottom, bottom up, relaxing, of, you know, the previous kind of very sort of rigorous textbook, um, kind of, uh, you know, equations of, um, of, of schizophrenia as a particular sort of discrete disease entity, as uh, they call it. Are there any more questions? You kind of alluded earlier on to the idea that perhaps um, Tilly was kind of prescient in, in kind of his approach to technology and that maybe the sort of 
Philip K. Dick version of events is now kind of widespread. And I was just kind of thinking a little bit about the kind of recent serial um, person of interest where the machine is seen to be kind of controlling or, or is listening in and to everything that is kind of going on in um, in US society. And I'm kind of wondering when, when we believe, all of us believe that we are routinely spied upon or listened into, our internet search histories might be viewable or kind of recognizable by some kind of power. Where, where does that leave us, do you think, in, in a kind of contemporary um, situation where we routinely be going on? Well, what would the agenda or the perspective be of a, a machine or a sort of computer? You know, what would it want to do with all that data? I think it's kind of difficult for us still to imagine what it is that machines want. Uh, I was just saying to Emma earlier, um, the uh, I was trying to remember when it was, um, Werner Vinge, the sort of science fiction writer, predicted that there'd be a, 2012 be the year of the singularity. This would be the point at which machines would achieve consciousness. When did he predict that? He said in 1972 or something, so it would be in 40 years. And if you go back to science fiction of that period, um, there's enormous amounts of stuff about robots and artificial intelligence and you know things that you can't tell whether they're machines or people. Um, you know, it's. I mean, technology has not, I think, broadly gone in that direction at all. It's gone in a much stranger direction. Uh, it's gone in a direction that has just kind of responded. It's been, um, I guess, what Marshall McLuhan called sort of Narcissus's mirror. You know, it's something that we've been able to look into um, and you know interrogate and kind of go deeper and deeper into. So it's it's gone in directions which. You know, are the directions that we've asked it to, but probably not the directions that we thought we were asking it to. <clears throat> Surely, it's not the machine that wants anything; it's the middleman and the uh, and the other guys who are mm. running the machine that want something. The machine itself is just a machine. I think that's right, and I think um, you know, even though yes, you know, heuristic programming and you know, uh, um, you know machines sort of set their own agendas in what they didn't before. You know, I still don't think in a sort of an, an animist would say that our, you know, that our computers are people. You know, if you've got a computer on your desk, um, it's probably got more processing power than well, Apollo 11 had. You know, it's connected to every other computer on the planet. It can mess with your head in all kinds of amazing ways, you know, with sort of films and games and everything. It can do all that. But actually, if you turn it off, it does nothing. You know, if sitting next to that computer, you have a plant, you know, a very simple plant. That plant is growing when you turn your back. You know, when you come back in, the plant will have done something different. You know, there's a reciprocal relationship going on there. And if you're interested in the plant for some reason, like you're growing it for a flower or because it's a cannabis plant or, you know, whatever, you know, you attune to it. You say it wants this, it likes this, it doesn't like too much sunlight. It needs, you know, um, you, you have that kind of relationship with it, even though it's, you know, in some ways very, very, very simple. The computer, for all its complexity, um, I agree with you. I think there's a sort of, um, you know, even though the lines can be blurred in all kinds of ways, I think there's a kind of category difference there that we haven't yet crossed. Hi. You know how there's all these um, news reports about um, like children, they're playing all these video games and then they're uh, going out and committing crimes and stuff. Do you think that's had an influence because of the way that the video uh, game is presented and it's had a massive influence on them? Uh, I mean, I think that is, that's you know, an anxiety which is very present in our culture. You know, uh, there's not a lot of kind of... Um, hard evidence that, um, you know, video games make people do things. Um, but uh, so I kind of see that as expressing a sort of um, a sort of unease and a discomfort with the fact that people are spending like, you know, young people are spending large amounts of time in front of games, you know, but that, you know, to me, that's just, uh, that's modern life. So Matthew was just talking about circumstance. Um, before he, he, get, he was put into bedlam, whatever, and and he was obviously 
interaction with a lot of different people and uh, living a kind of reasonably normal life and all that. Mm -hmm. But then, is it? Do you think it is the circumstance of of the locking up has brought all that out and what and kind of in general, kind of thing? You think of Guantanamo and all these places like that. As will that? Do you have that? Will it bring out that kind of thing in anyone, basically? Yeah, I mean, I think if Matthews hadn't been locked up, um, you can't tell because he never met him, but I think, um, you know, he would have, um, you know, he kind of had a had a handle on, you know, he understood perfectly well that, um, you know, the heirloom thing was something that he was obsessed by, but other people didn't... Um, uh, um, didn't see it and didn't get it, and he learned to be quiet about it. And that was kind of the argument that he always had with John Haslam. Um, you know, when um, Matthews was being interrogated by doctors for hours and hours and hours, and he sounded perfectly sane, then uh, Haslam would say, yeah, but of course he can sound perfectly sane, he's really good at that, but actually he still believes in the heirloom. Uh, but yeah, some people believe in fairies at the bottom of the garden, you know, some people believe, you know, people have all kinds of um, different beliefs, you know, there are all kinds of people who are perfectly, uh, you know, otherwise sort of normal and free who believe things that uh, other people don't believe, you know, if only a handful of people um, believed in religion, how strange would that look to everybody else? So I think Matthews is quite a good example of somebody who was probably, you know, his condition was probably brought upon him by being, uh, by, by being locked up. I mean, it's what, uh, and I think these days it's what psychiatrists would call an encapsulated delusion. You know, quite a lot of people have, uh, you know, if you get them onto a subject, you know, they have a kind of very bizarre set of beliefs about it, but they also understand when it's appropriate and not appropriate to talk about that. Uh, so, yeah, I think he's, um, uh, I mean, I, I think in a way he's a, he's, he's a kind of um, poster boy for the idea that, uh, you know, locking people up. Um, can often create a lot of the problems that it's supposed to be trying to solve. And that's kind of what the heirloom gang, in a way, were always um, saying to him. You know, he kind of understood that, you know, this was actually um, something that looked to the outside world as if he was being cared and looked after, but actually, you know, it was all about keeping him mad. I think, um, if, yeah, we take one final question. Um, I was just wondering if you know um, whether the early diagnoses of schizophrenia were in any way engendered, and if more male, more men than women were actually diagnosed with schizophrenia in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. um, and why you think that was, if there was a difference? Yeah, um, there are both. There are very famous um, cases of uh, of both. Tausk's kind of you know most famous case was a woman called Natalia A, who had kind of. Uh, influencing machine delusions. Um, what happened in the sort of second half of the 19th century was that there was an enormous kind of increase in um, sort of uh, female mental illnesses and female disorders, um, which was, you know, it's hard not to see it as being in some way related to the kind of constricted female roles at that time, you know. You know, literally physically constricted women having to be kind of laced up in corsets. It's hardly surprising that uh, um, you know a lot of women were highly strung and had panic attacks and fainted. You know, and then you've got diagnoses of things like nymphomania, which kind of reflected obviously male anxieties about kind of females being sexually active. Um, so this, um, when the diagnosis of schizophrenia came along, it came along at a time when there was this sort of huge anxiety about female nervous disorders and an enormous number of you know, an enormous number of new disorders being discovered. So it is gendered, but it's kind of a you know it's it's a you know it's a complex story across both genders. I think maybe if we um finish their book and always carry on more informal conversations uh, in the bar. Um, but I just want to say thank you very much, uh, Mike. It was really fascinating Great, well, discussion. Thank and um, thank you all for coming. Thanks.